Last Sunday, we celebrated the glorious resurrection of Jesus. And after that resurrection came a time of several weeks of preparation during which he prepared his disciples to go and be the church in a hostile world. After that, he went up to heaven, and a few days later, the Holy Spirit came down upon every follower of Jesus, and the world entered what we could call the church era, the time in which the church is the bride of Christ, doing the mission of Christ to make disciples of Christ. And this has not changed. We are still in the church era doing the mission of Christ, making disciples of Christ as the bride of Christ. And yet the world around us has suddenly changed quite dramatically. We are, no question, in a dire situation with widespread illness, isolation, anxiety, and economic devastation. In the last month alone, one out of every eight American workers has filed for unemployment. We are in a very bad season. But I would also say the world has changed in ways that are not quite so serious, but are very strange and even sometimes a bit humorous. And so right now, wherever you are worshiping, I would like you to just say out loud the the strangest way that you have seen this world change as a result of the coronavirus. And, And if you would, if you can, post that into the chat on Facebook or YouTube, the the strangest thing you've seen change about this world in this scene. Go ahead and and just share with those who are around you, and then if you can, share online with all the rest of us so so we can hear and get perhaps a little bit of of positive humor and spirit about all the the oddness of the world around us. I think that for myself, the, the strangest thing is that it is now suddenly extremely polite to drop something on someone's porch, ring the doorbell, and run away. (laughs) Without question, the fact that that is now good etiquette is a strange thing about this world. Indeed, the world has changed dramatically in ways large and small. And I want to be honest here. I think we need to recognize that the world is going to be different after coronavirus. Whatever after even means as we consider the specter of this virus hanging around for quite some time, ebbing and flowing, coming and going. This crisis is, in my opinion, absolutely going to change how we live our lives whenever it is we are able to resume going out for regular things. And I cannot predict exactly how. I am no prognosticator of the future, but we need to use this time to think carefully and prayerfully about how to follow Christ and how to function as the church, both during this crisis and beyond, in a world that has changed. There's going to be a new normal. We might not like that, but we need to come to terms with that. There's going to be a new normal, and we need to figure out what it looks like, how we even go about welcoming in, building up, and reaching out to a world that is different. We need to think and dream together about how to shine brighter as a lighthouse for Christ at the corner of Clipper and Mariner in a community with a new normal. Now, to help us think out loud in a biblical way, we are for a season going to work our way through Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. This letter is arguably the preeminent work in the Bible on church and Christian life. And what he said then applies to us now, and we just have to determine what that looks like in our new normal. It will, I think, help us see what and how we must change as the people of God in order to accomplish the unchanging purpose of God. And on that note, we begin today with some glorious truths that will never change. But we find at the beginning of the letter in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of of his glory. This is an extraordinary passage. It is a complicated passage, made more so by the fact that it is one very long sentence in the original language. And in it, Paul blesses and praises our triune God who works our blessing and salvation according to his eternal and unchanging purpose and will. And I will tell you, This is a tremendous comfort, and I hope that as we walk through this passage, you will come to agree to find great strength and comfort in this. As Paul celebrates many of the unchanging, coronavirus-proof wonders of our three-in-one God. As we still bask in the residual joy of our Easter celebration, let us, like Paul, celebrate each person of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, beginning with the will and purpose of God the Father. God's will is an overarching theme in this passage, in this prayer. Paul mentions it four times. And God's will and purpose are eternal and unchanging. God is all-knowing, all-wise, all-good, all-powerful. He stands astride space and time. His will and purpose existed before the foundation of the world, and it unfolds with perfect timing, what Paul calls the fullness of time. There's a huge comfort in this. When we embrace these truths, we we realize that COVID-19 is not a surprise or a challenge to God. There is nothing about our current situation that he cannot handle or that threatens in the slightest bit the accomplishment of his will and purpose in the world. Though we are experiencing the awful effects of living in a fallen world that has been marred by the effect of human sin, God's unchanging purpose to redeem for himself a people out of sin and out of rebellion and to restore fallen creation to perfection for his glory, that plan, that purpose will continue and will succeed on his schedule. As we consider the implications of this, we can begin to recognize that God is still carrying out his redemptive purpose even amidst crisis, and catastrophe. And we can also recognize that he does this entirely for his glory. Paul repeatedly speaks of God's glorious grace and the praise of his glory. We need to recognize that that God's glory is the vast weight. It is the, the radiant outshining of all of his attributes, all of his goodness and holiness and kindness and mercy and righteousness and justice and grace and wisdom, and knowledge, and power, and and so many more things. And the more we think about His glory, 
and really think about it, the more we realize that His glory is the greatest goal and purpose in the world, for He, God, is worthy of all glory. And that helps put so many things into perspective because we realize that within that unchanging and unstoppable God-centered purpose that cannot be derailed by COVID-19, we experience enormous personal blessings. Verse 3 tells us God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now think about that. In Christ, God blesses us with every spiritual blessing that heaven has to offer, now and forevermore. God the Father blesses us through Christ the Son with the blessings of God the Holy Spirit. This is how the Trinity, the triune God, works together for our blessing and for His glory, that as a follower of Christ, regardless of what your health or financial situation might be at this moment, you already have every spiritual blessing available to you in Christ. You have every resource you need spiritually, and, and nothing that goes wrong in this world can ever take that away from you. Now be further encouraged by this glorious truth that Paul proclaims, despite your current struggle, God chose you before time began. You are here today, you are watching today because God planned for you to be, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. All right? What a comfort to recognize that when it seems like everything is spinning out of control, you are not an accident. God's love for you is not an afterthought. And that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God adopted you as His Son with all of the, the rights and privileges of a king's son. And yes, you might be a woman and used to thinking of yourself as a daughter, but understand that the privileges and blessings that the Bible speaks of for a son apply to you as well if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says sons here. As verse 5 proclaims, In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. God chose you in love. God loves you in Christ, and His love does not depend on, on His mood or how the world is going or on your mood because His love for you began in eternity past. And it is not dependent on whether things are going well for you or, or terribly for you either before or during or after this pandemic. There is nothing you can do to, to earn more love than that infinite love you already have from God in Jesus Christ. And there is nothing you can do to lose that love. This is expressed through His grace, which Paul refers to in verse 6, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Now, the word grace describes a gift that is given from a superior to an inferior, a greater to a lesser, a gift we don't deserve and that we cannot earn. Grace is the gift that God gives us in love because of who He is, because He is the God of love, and because He is gracious. And this is why His grace can't ever be lost, because it is rooted in who He is, and who He is never changes. As we survey a world in which it seems so much else has changed, we should be comforted that God's love, grace, and adoption of us as His children through faith in Christ has not and will not change ever. But note, however, God's purpose in choosing us in Christ, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Recognize that if you are a follower of Christ, if you have embraced Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God chose you to be holy, right? And that means to be set apart and devoted to the Lord. And He chose you to be blameless, and that means avoiding all intentional and negligent sin in your life. The purpose in God's choosing you is for His glory. It is for you to be holy and blameless before Him. I want to let that sink in for a moment. Then I want you to consider, are you holy? Are you 
blameless. Now, in one sense, we are always holy and blameless in Christ because He is holy and blameless. But in another sense, we are given an awesome responsibility here to live up to that calling. So are you, to the best of your Spirit-filled power, holy and blameless? Are you fully devoted to the Lord? Set apart for Him in doing your best to resist, avoid, and flee intentional or negligent sin. What does this look like? Wait, what does holy and blameless look like during this lockdown? What will they look like in the new normal? We need to come to terms with this so that we come out of this a transformed and changed people. I would say there are many aspects of it we could certainly share online, and I would encourage you to put forth your ideas online, both now and afterward. But I would say that living holy and blameless right now looks like actively sharing kindness and love rather than harshness and hate. An awful lot of people are stressed out, anxious, upset, or angry about the current situation, and they are, they are letting it out. They are giving voice to that in anger, whether it is in person or online. And let me just say that living up to God's purpose in the moment means freely sharing kindness and love in public, in private, and yes, online. And doing that rather than sharing anger, bitterness, or resentment. I see Christians posting things on social media that are neither holy nor blameless. And if that describes you, stop immediately and be holy and blameless before the Lord. Being holy and blameless also means spreading truth and clarity, not lies or confusion. There is so much false, unproven, twisted, and spun information floating around from every imaginable source right now. And as someone who is called to be holy and blameless, you must not be part of the problem. We serve a God of truth, and yet I have seen some of you spread falsehoods online. So if you really want to share something about COVID-19 that you just got to get out there, Double, triple, quadruple check the facts with multiple independent, scientifically reliable sources. Then check Snopes.com before you share it. As a Christian, do not make Jesus look like a fool. Do not make him look like a liar. And do not make him look like a politician because that is not holy or blameless. Being holy and blameless requires promoting healing and unity right now rather than fostering division. With your spoken words, your written words, and your shares, always ask yourself whether you are intending to promote unity or just fan the flames of division. Are you part of healing what is so very wrong in our popular and political culture right now? Or are you just part of, of poisoning it more? Also, as reflect on what it means to be holy and to be blameless. On Wednesday night, I, I taught about the godly management of time. And I think if we are honest, before the coronavirus broke out, many of us had fallen into the trap of rushing around northern Virginia like chickens with our heads cut off, uh, frantically going from event to activity to other event to other activity. We were busy and we loved Jesus, but our lives weren't really holy because we weren't really devoted to the Lord. Our lives were devoted to us, to our kids, to our careers, to our empires we were building, but not to the Lord. All too often, God got the leftover scraps of our time. That's not holy. Now, in this moment where life has pressed pause, or, or perhaps a better concept would be resets, now is the time to reflect on how the how are you going to invest the 168 hours a week we are each issued to see whether your life is holy and genuinely devoted to God or not? Make your time count for the kingdom and, and be holy and blameless both now and after this lockdown ends. 
Having praised God the Father, Paul then celebrates our redemption and reconciliation through God the Son. And this is what the events leading up to Easter were all about. As verse 7 explains, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Now, redemption describes purchasing our freedom from bondage. This is a theme we see throughout Scripture, that in Christ we receive freedom from slavery to sin and death. Because Jesus bought our freedom. He bought our freedom through the sacrifice of His innocent and divine blood. You see, every human being is born into bondage, no matter where we are born or what socioeconomic class we are born into or what our status is today. We are born into an addiction to sin and to self. We simply cannot help but rebel against God's plan for our lives because we are selfish and we want everything our way. We even market to that in the United States. And so we each make choices that are selfish and hurtful, shameful and cruel, toxic and terrible. And these choices are called sin. And we are not only enslaved by the power of sin that is so appealing to our hearts, we are hopelessly separated from God by our sin. And because of our sin, we are also enslaved to death. Sin brought death into this world, and and we face death and condemnation by our holy God for our sins, and there is absolutely nothing that we can do about it. But Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, stepped into our world to do something about it for us. He took on a human nature to live the sinless life that we can't and to die as an innocent sacrifice of blood to atone for all our sins. At the cross of Good Friday, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. And at the the empty tomb of Easter, he proved that his sacrifice was sufficient to buy freedom for all who believe in him as Lord and Savior. As verse 7 explains, through his sacrifice, we receive forgiveness for our sins, but we need to recognize this isn't like when when we sometimes forgive people that we love and and they've done us wrong and, and we forgive them, but it's very grudging. That's not how he forgives us at all. In Christ, we are forgiven lavishly and graciously according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, right? Think about these words, lavished upon us. The riches of His grace are what we enjoy in Christ. And because it's grace, which means we can't earn it and don't deserve it, there is is nothing that our present predicament can ever do to take those riches away from us. Christ revealed God's will and purpose, which is to redeem us for His glory, to reconcile and unite us to and with God. Verses 9 and 10 explain that God made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. This, friends, is God's big picture, healing the devastation of the earth that's been caused by human rebellion and sin, ending our war against God that rages in our self-centered hearts and ushering in genuine peace, relationship, and friendship between us and the loving God who made us. And this means that both now and after lockdown, we must be people of reconciliation because we serve the God of reconciliation. We must devote our lives to bringing people to God, not for condemnation and humiliation, but for reconciliation with Him. And we must actively and intentionally seek to heal and reconcile our broken relationships and to heal those broken relationships between the races in our community and the nations of the earth because we serve the God of reconciliation whose purpose is to reconcile all things in Him. The church must be an agent of reconciliation, not division. Christians must work actively and intentionally for reconciliation. And and let's confess, friends, that in general, we have fallen far short of that. 
Christians must no longer be people who are divisive for any reason other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we should not support anyone who is divisive for any reason other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must reject the forces of division in our culture. We must repent of our own responsibility for encouraging and fueling them. We cannot support, retweet, or share any words that divide us other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, our world is a huge, ugly, fallen mess, and we must be instruments of healing, not harm. What I see online and out loud from people who claim to be Christians is awful. And so if you have said those things or thought those things or cheered them on, even if it was in the quiet of your own heart or home, you need to reject them and repent. Because our purpose, our calling is to truly be salt and light in our world, not just simply more of the same toxic, unchristian, angry rhetoric that we can find everywhere we look. And will it be harder and less popular to speak up for healing? Oh, yes, even within our own tribe of Christians. But that's what it means to actually follow Jesus now and in the future, and we need to be serious about this. Finally, Paul celebrates the seal and guarantee of God, the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity is the one who gives us complete confidence in our salvation and eternal future, no matter what changes in the world around us or what goes wrong. See, we have an eternal, unchanging inheritance in heaven as sons of God. In Him, we have obtained an inheritance. As followers of Christ, our inheritance, our promised land is not on this fallen earth. It is not America. It is not material wealth. It is not comfort during our life. Our inheritance is in heaven and on the renewed earth that will be ushered in when Christ returns. Our inheritance is part of God's eternal will. It is for his praise, as verse 12 explains, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. Our inheritance will be glorious. It will far surpass anything we could think or dream of owning here on earth. That is our forever home. This fallen world is not. And friends, we need to to really, really wrap our minds around this fact, right? That's our home. This fallen world is not. There is pain and difficulty in this world. It's not what God desired, but it is what our fall into sin caused. Both now and after COVID-19, we need to understand this is not our long-term home. It's never going to be perfect or pain-free. But the difficulties that we experience here, Scripture tells us, are brief and temporary, and they serve the purpose of preparing us for the beauty and the glory of our eternal inheritance in heaven. And so we need to live like this is not home and like heaven is, right? That is a radical change. That should change every single thing about how we live, work, and love this world, right? And we are called to live and work and love this world, but it needs to change the way we do these things for God's glory and purpose because this isn't home. And I want you to repeat that with me where you are right now. This isn't home. Home is far better than this. And the Holy Spirit lives within us to remind us of this truth, to mark us as God's treasured possession. Verse 13 says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. See, when we first put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, and He never leaves us. And he seals us, he marks us, he certifies that we belong to God, not not to ourselves, not to the world, not to the devil. We belong to God. 
And the Spirit is why we don't have to fear spiritual forces and, and enemies and the, the forces of darkness that are operating in this world because we are sealed and that guarantees that we are God's and that God is always with us. And the Spirit also guarantees our eternal salvation and inheritance. This is where Paul concludes in verse 14. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. We enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, convicting, comforting, challenging, and transforming us as the down payment that guarantees our eternal future with God. He is why we cannot lose our salvation once we've truly put our faith in Jesus Christ because the Spirit guarantees we will persevere in Christ until the end. And so we have nothing to fear spiritually if Christ is our Lord and Savior. We have nothing to fear spiritually amidst the difficulty, uncertainty, anxiety, and pain of this, this present crisis and all that lies ahead of us. Because we know the future and it hasn't changed a bit. It is glorious and guaranteed through the will of the Father, the work of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit. And so we can be bold in this time of fear and we can be confident in the victory of our triune God over every disease, disability, disaster, and even death itself. This is the power that is within us, the power that enables us to live for God's glory. This is never going to change, but it empowers us to change, and change we must. We are called to live today and tomorrow as we've always been called to live but have so seldom lived up to. We are called to be holy and blameless, to view every decision we make, every action we take, every word we speak through the lens of whether or not it brings glory to God. And no other lens. The world has changed and we must change too. But our God will never change. To Him be the glory. I'm going to pray, and when I finish, I want you to just take a moment to speak praises out, shout them out, sing them out, whatever you like to do at home to our unchanging God, and again, to share those online as well. Please pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, glorious Son, transforming Spirit, Lord God, three in one, to you be the glory forever and ever, Lord. You are glorified in the way that you work our salvation and our transformation and our glorification to the will of the Father, the work of the Son, the presence of the Spirit. Father God, we praise you for these unchanging truths about who you are and how you work and what your will and purpose is for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you will, you will hear our praises as we shout them out that you will delight in these praises. And I pray that these praises, as they, as they resound in the walls of our home and as they resound in our minds in the days to come, that they would remind us that while you do not change, you call us to be changed people. And I pray, Lord, that you will work in this time to bring change in our hearts and help us to see how we must change as individual followers of Jesus and as the church, the body of Christ, here to accomplish the mission and purpose of Christ. Lord God, change we must, we know we must. This world will be different, it already is. So guide us and give us the wisdom and the grace that we need to embrace the difficult changes that must be made so that your unchanging will and mission will be accomplished to ever greater glory for you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.